So uh, it's Alexander Lawrence, the Portable Infinite, um, and we're with uh, Andy Brown, Brian Lindstrom. The movie, the documentary is Lost Angel, the genius of Judy Sills and uh, Judy Sill, sorry. And um, yeah, uh, this has already been at a couple of docu um, film festivals, right? Yes, yeah, we premiered yeah. at Doc NYC in November 2022 and kind of did the festival circuit. And we're about to have our theatrical release next week and, and, and the, streaming as well. The the um, the reaction's been good, I, I imagine. Yeah, we very good. We're pretty we're, we're... relieved. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Let me mention that it's going to be coming out in April 12th. It'll be in LA and New York, Portland, a lot of other cities, and people can probably find it, you know, for streaming somewhere too. And um, Apple to be in Amazon and um, Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So like, um, yeah, when um. I think of documentaries and stuff like this. I remember I think of the um the Stooges Jim Jarmusch documentary because he he um I mean there's only that one concert where Iggy Pop is like spreading butter on himself or uh <laughs> or whatever it is, peanut butter. And um they I mean so the, so like when you're doing a movie about someone like Judy Sills, it's like and you start that, it's like where do you go? Like, is there even, I mean, besides the old gray whistle test and is there any information? I mean, that was, it was a nine year uh, process for you guys. I mean, where, where did you guys start? I mean, I mean, did you know that there was any footage or documentation at all? We had hoped there would be, but there was none really. And so it became a puzzle to how we tell Judy's story in her own voice with nothing really, um, other than a few audio clips of her on live albums to do that. Um, so, but we found things to do it with, uh, mainly a uh, hour long audio interview she gave telling her life story up into around 72 and then her journals uh, and, and drawings from uh, that came from her cousin in a box of these were all Judy's worldly possessions. And we were able to construct a voiceover from 73 to 79 when she passed away from that material, which a voiceover actress reads. And also at that point, we were able to come up with a visual element and animation style based on Judy's drawings, which are in the film. And uh, also, and then lastly, we, we got multi-tracks for Heart Food and the her posthumous album, Dreams Come True, that create hopefully the effect that judy's scoring the film mm. uh so that was how we kind of puzzled out how to have a first person uh a narrator a judy telling her own story without there being filmed interviews and so on that we never really added to the what's already out there in terms of the film stuff a little few things and the the lack of a kind of traditional uh archive or you know very little archive uh was it kind of uh, really lit a fire under us to kind of find alternative ways? And it really made us, you know, research deeply, like, you know, where might Judy's last things be? Or, you know, could there possibly be uh, an audio tape of an interview? You know, so it, it really uh, was kind of an example of trying to use what uh, ostensibly might seem like a, a weakness or an obstacle as really uh, impetus to find, you know, creative workarounds. Yeah, I mean, that's really true. I think also it, in terms of photo, what, photo research to illustrate something she's saying, it makes you really just try to find the exact right photo that will, will, will you know, illustrate what the Ventura School for the Girls where she did, you know, went to reform school was like, and just, just, spend hours looking for that right photo, you know, because we didn't have the other, you know, uh, yeah. traditional documentary stuff. Yeah, I mean, some people, I mean, that's kind of, as documentary filmmaking is kind of evolving, I mean, you're seeing like a lot of people using more animation and films and um, using actors and because uh, when, when the person has like some diaries to reenact some of the diaries, like uh, there's a new film with um, Anita Pollenberg where Scarlett Johansson yeah. plays the plays Anita and stuff. And um, 
So, um, yeah, like um, when I look at 70s music, I mean, there's like Laura Nairo, Karen Dalton, kind of similar sure. kind of unknown artist. And um, I mean, and then you go over to Judy Sill and I mean, she was like the only one kind of doing Baroque form composition and choral music and and bring it into the set because like i mean most of those guys were i mean like you look at like singer songwriter stuff i mean most of those were coming from mostly from a country or folk background she was coming from this whole other direction i mean can you comment on that a little bit she was really her own unique artist you know it's really hard to even imagine placing judy and like the laurel canyon <laughs> group i mean she really just seems you know from her first recorded song which she was 19 years old she won a song writing contest at la valley college uh and we have that song in the film uh poor ten poor tender maiden's lament and you just can just hear the the fullness of her talent and i would say genius you know in the first few notes of that song i mean it's just distinctive and I think her, the musical palette that she was drawing from was very different from that her label mates um, and what was, I guess, popular also at the time. So she was more influenced by by uh, gospel. And, you know, she said her main influences were Bach, Pythagoras and Ray Charles. Um, I think uh, I would throw in. Well, she said country as well. And what she meant by that was Texas country, like like Chill Wills, that kind of. Um, hill country country music um so she she had all these strange influences that were were not typical and she had such a great ear she had perfect pitch she was able to just sort of you know figure out a way of combining them all instrumentally um yes, so she was like a sort of a karen carpenter kind of singer too because she she was like another person that was like was a, had really good pitch back mm -hmm, in the time. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, yeah, yeah, there was a, I mean, she was like the first artist, uh, David Geffen Asylum. I mean, you think like, he's like the guy you want to be on because I mean, he's, I mean, he broke probably in the seventies, he broke more artists than anybody else, sold more records than anybody else. Uh, Clive Davis, maybe a number two there. Um, yeah, I mean, it just seems like it was, it was a hard sell for some reason, like, uh, just people... It, it wasn't easily digestible music for some reason. No, but neither was Laura Nero and, and, and Geffen loved her. So he had a good ear himself, you know, he knew what quality was for, you know, um, I think everybody would agree with that. You know, he signed great people to that label. I think, well, in Laura Nero's case, I think she played Monterey and everyone thought she was too, she, she wasn't part of the hippie thing. She was a little, to show business uh, for people's taste or some of these, she just mm. kind of came off. I mean, cause like the big stars of Monterey were like Hendrix and, you know, the who and Otis Redding. And it was just a total different and people like Laura Nero is probably her moment, but she didn't really capitalize on that moment. Well, uh, yeah. he, she famously broke Geffen's heart by signing with Columbia. So he loved her. And um, yeah, Tommy Peltier seems to be a big figure in the the whole world. I mean, he just, I think he played a show in LA a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, uh, he, I think he has a record uh, kind of dedicated to Judy Sill that just came out and see, he's like touring and stuff. Uh, what was, what was like meeting him or. Uh, oh, Tommy's a delight, you know, and, and uh, that, that was one of the great things about making this film is we get to meet people like Tommy and, you know, one advantage of <laughs> taking nine or 10 years to make a film is that you stay in contact with the people who are really interested in it, like Tommy. And, you know, he becomes a dear friend. I mean, I, I'm I, I'm going to the premiere in New York on the 11th and I'm flying to the one in L.A. on the 12th, largely because I want to be there with, with and have see Tommy watch the film. Because yeah, Tommy he, and Russ yeah. I've always imagined that moment, you know, I'm not going to miss that. So. That was a huge uh, motivation for Andy and I just on a personal level is, uh, you know, wanting to be in an audience in a theater with Tommy and Russ as the film's being shown. Well, and some of these friends have passed since we, other friends have passed since we, we made the film. So, you know. 
Well, um, motivator yeah, I mean, as well. I mean, Judy Sill, I mean, like, I guess, I guess uh, so the seventies were kind of the days before rehab, like an artist nowadays would, would uh, do the record tour and then go into rehab <laughs> kind of <laughs> re and re refresh and re uh, restart and stuff. And, but they didn't have those, the Betty Ford clinic hadn't been invented yet, I guess. And uh, you know, like she, she kind of uh, was from another era where, you know, like drug use and heroin use was, was mainly something that was like kind of underground and you didn't really talk about it. And a lot of people OD'd back then because they were pretty much by themselves. Yeah. Yeah, not only that, but also, you know, terms like PTSD or childhood trauma, you know, were, weren't in the vernacular and people didn't talk about things like sex abuse, you know, sexual abuse, which Judy suffered at the hands of her stepfather, you know, so she, she had a tough, uh, a tough road in terms of like having to deal with a lot of these personal traumas without having the kind of societal structure to support her. Yep. And um, yeah, I mean, I just thought, yeah, you, you kind of mentioned like how she sort of mixed genres. Like, I mean, she was almost like 20 years ahead of a time. I mean, almost in the, in the 90s. And uh, I mean, you know, like uh, well, in the 80s and 90s, I think like that was like the thing to do some kind of proto mashup. I mean, she was like mixing things back in 71, which um, nobody really associated with each other before you know so it was like a, it was a little a little bit hard to digest i think yeah i think i think it's i mean she's arguably more well known now than she was in her lifetime and i think part of that is because people uh, you can find the stuff you can find her work more easily now so there's more people who can respond to it but um you know it was not what was popular at the time that's for sure and um, yeah, I mean the and the interviews I heard. I mean, she, I mean, she seemed a little bit more like a deep thinker than most artists. I mean, she was like dealing with philosophy and religion, and uh, and that that kind of shows up in her music a little bit. I mean, can you talk yeah, about that a little bit. And I think it it requires repeated listening to her songs for them to open up, and you can see all that's going on. So that's antithetical to, in some ways, the radio. Yeah you know, how, how a lot of people listen to music on the radio. Um, you know, listening to Judy for me reminds me of listening to the Beatles, like with headphones on and you always hear new things because there's so much going on, even in the simpler songs, so much nuance. And uh, I just wanted to mention that um, Los Angeles, the genius of Judy Sill is in theaters on Amazon, Apple TV, April 12th. You guys are going to the... Um, and then, yeah, you had other people involved, uh, other producers, Maya Hawk, you know, that's pretty well known. I mean, how, how and, and Brian, Brian, you're a producer too on this film too. Yes. How, how did you guys all work together? Just uh, very cooperatively. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, a, you know, a labor of love and really all wanting Judy's music to give be given its proper attention what what's what's next for after this film what are you guys gonna work on what, what do you got planned next do you think or, or do you got something going on right now what's uh, i'm i'm working on a documentary about incarcerated moms and their children and i'm down here in new orleans working on a film about music here in the bywater neighborhood of new orleans and specifically a club a la a dive bar lounge called bj's lounge um so that's what i've been doing um i don't really have a time but uh and are there any books or films that you guys would like to recommend to our listeners here hmm. um, you mean uh connected like you, to, to judy well, it could be connected but uh just that you read recently or like a documentary or a good film you saw recently oh boy yes no. <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm reading a lot of books about New Orleans, and there's one about oh, okay. the 1927 hurricane, R Rising Tide, which is just so good because it's all about, it has a lot to do with American history. I'd recommend that. It's just a wonderful book, uh -huh. Rising I'll, Tide. I'll go check it out. And, um, uh, Brian? I'm reading, let me get, I want to get the title right. Uh, 
I am reading a book called <laughs> I'm almost Cat there. The hat. Cat in the hat comes <laughs> back. <laughs> Because I, I only ask because I've seen a couple of your interviews and it seemed like there was a lot of books and and uh, stuff. Oh, it's wallpaper. That's just wallpaper. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm yeah. reading a book uh, by Howard Fishman called To Anyone Who Ever Asks, The Life, Music, and Mystery of Connie Converse. Okay. Oh, that just came out, right? And it's very interesting. Yeah, that that is related to Judy in a way. Okay. I think... Um... I think we went past our 12 minutes or oh, okay, something. Okay, all right. I mean, uh, where's... I'm trying to think of a movie, but I guess... All right, forget it. Is our uh, <laughs> is our other person still there? Or... 